Welcome to uh, women in the first chair in high profile cases. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, my name is Susan Bazorgi. I'm from Miami, Florida. Uh, I have my own firm. We're three women lawyers, uh, proud to say. Um, and I want to start by introducing our fabulous panel of lawyers, period. Um, we have Chris Argetis from San Francisco. Uh, she has a firm, Ar Arguetis, Kasman, and Headley. Um, and she's led a boutique practice in San Francisco uh, since leaving the Federal Public Defender's Office. And Chris has always been a trailblazer in, in this field. And you will hear more today about how she's probably um, turned corporate America and how they choose counsel a little bit on its head when FedEx chose her as their lead counsel in uh, representing them in an indictment. Um, we also have uh, Susan Bruni over to my right from New York City who has led the field representing individuals in white co collar matters. Um, she's never been in a big firm. Instead, since leaving the US Attorney's Office, she has led a uh, white collar boutique practice in New York City. Uh, also to my right is Jamila Hall. Um, Jamila Hall uh, has um, been in and out of um, Jones Day. Um, um, first went in as associate, then she went in the U.S. Attorney's Office and spent many, the, many years there trying cases, and now is a partner in Jones Day in Atlanta. Um, to my left is Beth Wilkinson um, from D.C. Beth spent many years as a partner at Paul Weiss, but two years ago left with another woman, Alexandra Walsh, to start her own firm, Wilkinson Walsh, Walsh, and left with around 12 lawyers and now is proud to say that they have quickly grown within a two-year period to 45 strong. So uh, let's, let's start focusing on why we're here today to talk about women lead lead um, trial counsel. Uh, and I think what brought us to this conversation were some studies that took place in the last two years. 2015, there was a study called First Chairs at Trial from the ABA, American Bar Foundation, and Commission on Women in the Profession. And I'm gonna quickly give you these statistics, and I'm gonna spend about a minute on them. And this is what the statistics found. 24% of women were lead counsel, 27% were trial attorneys. That, that's basically of the universe of, of trial lawyers or lead counsel, those were the percentages that were women. Um, recently in 2017, the New York State Bar Association report found that female attorneys represented 25.2% of attorneys appearing in commercial and criminal cases in courtrooms across New York. Female attorneys accounted for 24.9 of the lead counsel and 27.6%. Uh, and what was an interesting statistic was that as the cases got more complex, the numbers decreased. Um, and the numbers went from anywhere from the 30% to the as low as 19% as multi-defendants increased and the cases became more complex. But we're here to tell you a different story. Um, we're here to tell you that these statistics aren't the whole story and that they aren't the entire story of what's happening for women in the field, that women are excelling, that women are in lead counsel roles, and which is gonna be evidenced by what you're gonna hear from the four, four lawyers that are seated at these tables. Um, and these panelists come from all different backgrounds. They have gotten to where they are from all different paths, and we're gonna discuss that as we go further into their backgrounds later on. Um, so let's start with, we wanna talk about some of their cases and some of their exciting lead roles that they've had. So we're going to take those statistics and we're going to throw them out the window today. So let's start with Chris. And we're going to focus on a past case and a, and a current case. 
And I think, Chris, why don't you start us off with talking about FedEx a little bit. Well, so I'm very happy to talk about FedEx. I'll talk about it to anyone who wants to hear it any time. <laughs> it's one of the best cases I've ever had. Um, the short version, well, for, first you need to know this. So, so I, my law firm actually is in Berkeley, California, which is even way worse than being a woman lawyer in San Francisco. You have to say I'm from Berkeley to corporate America. Um, and we have between five and seven lawyers at any particular time. So it was extraordinarily unusual for a Fortune 100 company, Fortune 50 company, I guess, like FedEx, to decide that, that I and my small firm in Berkeley should be their counsel for what was a I think it was a 13 count uh, criminal indictment in federal court in San Francisco. So I guess we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that in a second, but to just lay it out a little bit, uh, FedEx, well there's such a thing as online pharmacies you might know. You can go online and say, I love Valium, and you will be taken to a website where you fill out a little questionnaire and the website people take it to a doctor, a real doctor in a white coat with a prescription pad, and that person signs a script, issues you Valium, uh, and also other certain kinds of what we in San Francisco call lifestyle drugs. <laughs> and then they take it to a pharmacist, they fill it, and they ship it to you. And when you want a lifestyle drug, you want it right away. So they f ship it to you overnight. And they either shipped it with FedEx or with UPS, sometimes with the post office. And so the United States government, in its wisdom, decided that both FedEx and UPS were committing crimes when they would ship these packages because they actually knew, or they should have known, that the, packages, that the prescriptions were illegally given because you're supposed to have a face-to-face -face meeting, they said, before you got a script. And that there were so many, you know, thousands of packages, it's a whole long story. But anyway, they decided that they knew, therefore they were in a conspiracy with the online pharmacies, so they were charged with conspiracy drugs. They were also charged with money laundering for, for being paid for taking these packages. So to FedEx's everlasting credit, the government went to both UPS and FedEx and offered them a non-prosecution agreement where they pay some money you know, have a little compliance and the case goes away. UPS accepted that deal and they got an NPA. They paid $50 million. They did it on a Friday afternoon. It was an article this big in the Wall Street Journal and their stock went up the next day and no one ever heard about it again. FedEx, because of who they are, who their chief executive was, who their board was, said, we don't think we committed a crime and we're not gonna say that we did. And if you want to indict us, indict us and, and we're gonna have a trial. So that was a moment of bravery that most corporations don't ever have, but they had it. So they found themselves with an indictment. And you know, I, as I say, I could talk about this forever, but I just do have to tell this one little story. In my opinion, the United States Attorney's Office didn't believe that FedEx was gonna really do this. And they thought that this was just a negotiating posture. Because the point came where the United States Attorney called me up and said, if they don't come in and pay this amount of money, it was a huge number, by Wednesday we're gonna indict them. This was like on a Thursday before the Wednesday. So I talked to the clients and I called to her back the next day and I said, well, they're not paying, so what time is the arraignment? And she said, uh, uh, do you want another couple weeks? <laughs> and I said, they don't need another couple weeks. They're never doing anything. They're not paying a nickel. So let's go. And we didn't get the indictment that next Wednesday or the next Wednesday or the next Wednesday. And while I can't prove it, I believe that she thought and everybody thought that they would never really do it because corporations never really do. But anyway, so the indictment comes and you want me to talk about how I got hired? Yeah, point? I think it's important okay. to know. I mean, so you're not the typical No, lawyer. I am really not. The typical FedEx right. is based in Memphis. I am like way the opposite of anybody they would ever hire to be a lawyer. I'm, I'm gay. I'm from Berkeley. 
I have five people in my office. I've never prosecuted anybody in my life. You know what I mean? <laughs> so <laughs> they, they were looking, though, for a trial lawyer. In fact, and I, I wish I could put this on my website. They said they were looking for the oh shit lawyer meaning the lawyer that the prosecutor would say, oh shit, when they heard they had hired that person. And they decided that was me. And the reason they decided that was me, I think primarily, and this goes to your overall question, is I had just finished trying the Barry Bonds case in San Francisco, the, the lying to the grand jury case. So that was a big, high profile, heavy duty, you know, really hard trial. And so they knew, and it, it ended well. So I think, that that's what drew them to me. And I think further what drew them to me was because I'm not, oh, by the way, I've never been in a big firm either. I don't have any of the big firm hedging thing. You know, so I'm totally, I just told them exactly what I thought about the case. Which wasn't, you know, I had a much more negative view of the case actually than they did. But they liked, they liked that. And so all together, they thought, well, she knows how to try a case. She talks straight to us, and, and we're putting our money on Berkeley. Well, it obviously worked. <laughs> OK, so let's, let's switch over to Susan Bruni. Uh, Susan, talk to us about Lynn Tilton, the diva of distress. I can only do that from the podium. I'm going to talk about an SEC enforcement case that was brought against Lynn Tilton also known as Susan said as the diva of distressed, not distressed, distressed, like distressed debt, <laughs> not distress. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about our victory before an administrative law judge. Now, I worked on this case from 2009 through the trial and so I have to think carefully about what to talk about that doesn't drive everyone from the room uh, because it's just too much detail. So what I'd like to do is give you all a brief outline of what the case was about. I'd like to give some observations on the SEC's administrative court in theory and in reality, and then I'd like to give you my sense of why we won. So first of all, I, I give you Lynn, the diva of distressed, a graduate of the Yale uh, College, actually a brilliant investor, very high profile with, a, as you can see, quite unusual public persona. She has a million Twitter followers, and as you can see, it's, it's hashtag all Lynn. Uh, she invented some very innovative co collateral, <laughs> collateralized loan obligations, or CLOs, and there was actually an article about her uh, invention, spinning straw into gold. The idea was that she was going to access the capital markets for, via the CLOs actually to invest in distressed companies and distressed debt, which was a new niche. And it was uh, her invention that actually caused the rating agencies for the first time to accept that collateral class. Now, you know what happened next. There was the financial crisis. And these distressed companies performed badly in the financial crisis. Yet, as we would contend she was permitted to do by the governing indentures, she held all of these investments at par, at the amount that she had invested to acquire them. And as the deal documents entitled her to do, she continued to take 2% of assets under management as her annual management fees. Uh, she took, according to the SEC, a wrongful amount of approximately $240 million in fees. This all had to do with how the indenture was written, which the SEC said was, oops, here are some of her many products. Excuse me, I forgot to talk about those. She actually owns MD Helicopters, which is McDonnell Douglas, Stila Cosmetics, uh, Rand McNally, which is now digital, and a bunch of other uh, companies, approximately 75 of them. The SEC said that the definitions in the indenture were clear as can be. Well, I don't know about that. It was pretty complicated. Um, there were trustee reports, though, that gave a lot of detail about how all of these investments were performing, which I think was 
one of the saving graces in this case. In any event, as, as I said, I worked on this case from 2009 all the way up through the trial. Uh, at some point, Lynn got the idea that it was good to have a big firm alongside my small firm, and uh, she brought in Brendan Sullivan, you may have heard of him. Uh, and he was terrific. I had a lot of fun working alongside him. We presented to the SEC uh, and um, laid out our defenses, and it's my view, and I can't prove it either, that the SEC chose its administrative law court because the SEC knew that we had a real defense to the case. I believe you. Thank you. I knew you would, and I absolutely think it's true. Now, as you may have seen, since I know you're all in the white collar space, Lynn was not a person who was going to go quietly about having been shunted before an administrative law judge. She went on a crusade, and she went on TV a lot about these issues. By that point, my big firm partners uh, were Skadden Arps, Williams and Connolly having gone by the wayside. And Skadden had a theory, which we all know now, about how the administrative law judges were appointed and how that violated the appointments clause of the Constitution. And we litigated that case. We had the fun of suing the SEC. The district court judge was kind of unimpressed uh, with our lawsuit. And uh, in the meantime, everybody who'd been sued by the SEC started filing all these well, Lynn would say copycat lawsuits. They began to pursue the same attack on the administrative forum. And then we're still going to trial. We're not getting any resolution. And then we got a stay from the Second Circuit, actually, which meant it was all very pencils up. And uh, we waited to get the resolution and didn't prepare for trial because, well, I don't think Lynn wanted to have us be doing that when she was so confident that things were going to work out for her in the Second Circuit. In the meantime, the SEC purported to reform its administrative system, and it actually put out various pronouncements about all the things that it was going to do to sort of level the playing field. As you all know, they uh, proposed more relaxed time limits for administrative proceedings. Maybe, wow, there could be depositions. Uh, and the rule of evidence they suggested might sometimes apply in the administrative system. And they actually put all this out for notice and comment. And, you know, I thought, well, I have some comments. So I actually, <laughs> I actually commented. I was the first person to comment. Uh, and my <laughs> comments were, well, you know, fine. It's nice to make all these reforms. But how about just actually going to district court where we could actually have a well-established set of due process protections. Alas, the Second Circuit ended up lifting the stay, did not rule in Lynn's favor, and there we were again on the eve of trial. This time, my big firm companion was Gibson Dunn, to whom I introduced Lynn, and we had the fun of going to trial. And for me, this was kind of like riding in a gilded carriage. Gibson Dunn had 40 lawyers on the trial. I'd never tried a case like this. It was great. And I ended up very much enjoying working with them. Uh, but given that I knew the case, it was still my case. Uh, I put Lynn on the stand. I cross-examined two of the three victims the SEC put up there. I put on the experts. And it was really pretty great. Uh, there had been extensive pretrial motion practice. We wrote terrific, terrific pretrial motions every one of which got denied by return email by the administrative law judge. Uh, but we went to trial. The judge showed up wearing a robe, and it was held in a courtroom. And she brought with her from DC a little nameplate that she put up that said, Judge so-and-so. Uh, the deputy clerks were actually the SEC's paralegals, which I thought was sort of a terrific way for them to build relationships. And she hated us. She hated us. It was unbelievable. Every day for the first few days, it was like there were thunderclouds coming out of this judge's eyes. It was uh, really quite upsetting. And the way that she made evidentiary rulings was kind of like, I, I don't know. Well, let's just see. Uh, there was no willingness to enforce any of the subpoenas that we had issued. Uh, and every day, the SEC ALJ's workmates from the SEC, including 
pretty high level people at the SEC sat in the spectators gallery and sent her some good karma waves uh, that she might rule for the SEC. It was way worse than I had imagined when I wrote my comments. Why did we win despite all of that? Well, like every trial lawyer, we didn't give up. And there was a moment when we were able to turn this judge. And that moment is Matt Mock. Matt Mock, partner in Vardy Partners, a value investing hedge fund. No stranger to hair product, Mr. Mock. <laughs> Mr. Mock worked at a vulture fund, which meant that he had bought certain of the notes from the CLO, CLOs on the secondary market, presumably at a steep discount once the investors started to suffer in the financial crisis. And of course, our theory was that Mr. Mock and Vardy knew all along what they were buying into. We'd issued a subpoena to Vardy trying to understand certain things like how much had they paid for the notes and what had they understood about the notes. And Vardy just defied, defied the subpoenas. Judge didn't do anything about it. I, I like to think that what he received at my hands was a blistering cross-examination. And this was the craziest thing, and I'll give you just an example. He refused to answer with impunity questions like the one that's highlighted here. May we know the price that you believed was an appropriate price based on your analysis? Well, no, <laughs> that's proprietary. At a trial where this man was being presented as a victim? But here, I think, is where things began truly to turn. That's when Mr. Mock decided to mansplain to me about <laughs> CLOs. <laughs> Happiest moment of my life, he said. He said, I'd like to give you a simple example. And I said, you can give me a simple example or you can give me a complicated example. And uh, our judge, and now I like her, his name is Judge Folak, and I kind of had a moment when he started to give me an example of an investment that involved, say, $100 a year, when at issue was $2.5 billion worth of notes. <laughs> so for that, I owe Mr. Mock a, a debt of gratitude, and particularly at the very end when I said, Mr. Mock, you present yourself here as a fraud victim, and perhaps unnerved by all the tough questioning he'd received and embarrassed that he was sort of being required to be made out to be sort of an idiot, he said, I, I didn't come here as, I'm not a fraud victim. <laughs> oh, okay, no further questions to you. <laughs> Craziest thing. Second reason we won was, was Lynn's testimony. Uh, she was on the stand for uh, almost four days, and I like to stand at a podium, but I have to say by the end of day three and a half or so, I was out of my shoes because it just went on and on from the beginning of her time at Drexel Burnham and on and on and on. Uh, every time the SEC objected, and here was my realization, this is actually a court that's kind of flexible, and if the judge is working for you, can be great. So every time the SEC objected, it was just like on TV. I got to stop and give a little speech about how we were right and the SEC was wrong, and the judge let me do it, and then would sometimes summarize what I just said, and then I would say, that's just right, Your Honor. It's terrific. Uh, and I think ultimately we won because of these trustee reports. It was fundamentally a false case. The investors had the information to understand what they were buying into. Anyway, it was terrific fun. It was exciting to see the defense theories that I'd been working on so hard come to life in this trial. And after a year of opinion writing, the judge, in what was probably the final ruling of her career, ended up uh, acknowledging all of this and giving Lynn a complete vindication. Yep. Okay, next we're gonna hear from Jamila Hall. And Jamila has been involved in representing an executive who was indicted um, in regards to the tenant health care um, case. Well, I have to say it's kind of hard coming after Susan, I, although I, I can't wait till next year when I can tell you about my acquittal. Um, 
And uh, yeah. so, yeah, it's coming, it's coming. <laughs> and so, um, you know, Susan's question to me, Susan Bazorgi, um, question to me is, well, talk about how you're at a large law firm and you're getting first chair trial experience and how that, that came about. And um, because we're sort of short on time, there's a career before that, um, the thing I, I notice most is the clients. Um, the clients are asking. Uh, and oftentimes, and in two recent matters, I wasn't the person that was called initially at Jones Day. I have amazingly talented partners who received these calls, and by the time we sat down, met with the client, and I laid out my thoughts on trial strategy, I ended up being the person that the client uh, wanted to, to be the lead of the, of the trial team. And so, um, you know, it's, it, there's not a set rocket science to it or a special formula. I think a lot of it is being yourself um, because there are, as you can tell, lots of preconceived notions about people at big law firms um, from my <laughs> co-panelists here. <laughs> and, um, and, and I only have just begun. <laughs> I know, I'm sure, I'm sure. But one of the things that I think is, is different for me is that I'm always going to be myself, whether I'm at a white shoe firm or not. And so I think I actually end up standing out more at a large law firm because people have a certain expectation as to what that's going to look like. And I'm not afraid to tell a client the real um, and I'm not afraid to go out there on some, and I'll tell you about, you know, some ri pretty risky or just novel strategies. I'm just not going to give up the same as these other women. And so we represent uh, an executive in the tenant health care matter. And I think most people in the room are sort of familiar generally with the uh, allegations that um, three, four hospitals in the Georgia and South Carolina area um, who had a relationship with clinics that provided prenatal care uh, to undocumented and mostly Spanish-speaking women, uh, the government has this theory that those relationships with those clinics, because they also hired translators from the clinics to be inside the hospitals when the women were delivering their babies, that that fair market value contract somehow is a kickback under AKS. And uh, Tenant, um, to my dismay, uh, settled uh, both criminally and civilly for half a billion with a B dollars. Uh, so that's, a, that's an issue that we'll um, hopefully not have to deal with. But in looking at our, our particular case, one of the things that I love about it is the government, although our case was all in Atlanta and in South Carolina, uh, the government indicted our client um, on the eve of the statute of limitations in the Southern District of Florida. And so uh, when, the email, when the email came through, because that's how we were informed of the indictment, although the investigation had been going on for four years, um, when the email came through, I called Susan Vizorki, because I was like, oh my God, what am I gonna do, get, get, how am I gonna get him down in Miami? I don't even know these folks down here. You know, uh, one of the things that I think everybody loves is, is being on your home court. Um, and for my friends from Northern District of Georgia, we love it at home, it's good. You know, we have great judges, they know us, and they know that we're not gonna come with any BS. So the case was indicted in the Southern District of Florida on a mailing. Uh, they alleged um, a $10 billion case with a $400 million loss, all happening in Georgia and in South Carolina, and their only connection to the Southern District of Florida was one piece of mail. Um, that was just offensive to me, and um, once Susan helped me get my client bond, <laughs> and we got the, got out of Miami, I started um, trying to brainstorm how we were going to get back to where we belonged, um, because I was convinced, and I think rightfully so, that the government was looking for a way uh, to have their own home court advantage. Um, those of you that are familiar with Southern District of Florida, they don't like health care fraud there. They have nursing homes, people that actually have been suffering from different fraud that um, home health agencies have propounded on them. It's a very, uh, it's not an area that would be also hospitable to uh, a group of people that were supporting undocumented patients. Um, and so we filed a motion to transfer venue. Uh, it was a strong motion, well briefed, and it was summarily denied. Um, after that motion was filed, we came to learn that the government had interviewed 400 witnesses. They brought 75 in the grand jury. Um, out of those, 300 were from the state of Georgia. Two were from Florida. Mm -hmm. So I was talking to Susan Bazorgi one day, and I'm like, I, this is making me so mad. I can't, I can't do this. And Susan says, 
well, you know, the judges are really nasty down here. I don't know. And he said, we, we got to file a motion for reconsideration. We got we to gotta tell them now that this is what's happening. This is an injustice. And it took a few days for Susan to <laughs> come around and, and agree to put her name on my brief. <laughs> um, but she did. And um, we exposed the venue for what it was. And, and the, the order that came out in that case, um, the judge cited three different songs saying he was sending us back to Georgia. And it was, um, it's, um, it's going to be a, a rocky road, but I, I think this first part, now us being back where we belong, um, is, is at least putting us in a place to have a fair trial. I look forward to telling you all about the acquittal next year. Um, but I was very glad to have Susan come in and, and show me what the ropes are in Southern District of Florida. I'm glad to not be there anymore. Um, but I'm also glad for the client who was very concerned about being in that territory that we just didn't give up. We're just going to find a way um, no matter what. And the government even appealed the, the uh, reconsideration order. And then the district judge uh, had us set for trial July 10th in Florida, in Miami. We were getting set up. I, I canceled a trip to, to Europe. My, I was going to send my family by themselves. Um, and. Uh, Two weeks before that, the judge came through and um, affirmed the order. And so we are firmly in Georgia and looking forward to a, a good battle at trial. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. OK, so we have Beth Wilkinson. Um, and you want to talk about, you, I know you have a trade secret case or the chairman of the board in an opioid case. I think I'll do the, the chairman of the board in That's an what opioid I thought. case. Um, for degree of difficulty, yeah. I'll put that pretty <laughs> high up there right now. I just want to start by saying I am delighted to be on this panel of amazing trial lawyers. And I think it's a tribute to there are many ways to success. Uh, Chris says she doesn't know why her client hired her. Her client hired me for a mere civil case after that and told me if I could be anything like Chris, <laughs> that maybe I could keep them happy. And as Judge Breyer said just today, Chris is one of the greatest trial lawyers he's ever seen. So okay. I'm honored to be on a panel with you and everyone else. Um, I am a, probably a tribute to downward mobility and why that can make you incredibly successful. <laughs> so for some of you, I hope that makes you hopeful. Um, I left the government after prosecuting Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, which was a highlight as a prosecutor. And um, I think some people thought everything was downhill after that, but it led to a lot of great experience and a lot of great opportunities. So I thought, I can't say much about my current case. It's out of Boston. Uh, it's a company named Insys, and the chairman of the board is my client, Dr. John Kapoor. And I look forward to telling you about his acquittal a little after Jamila's. Uh, but he was indicted a year after uh, the rest of the senior management at the company. He's a 74-year-old man, and the government decided, even though he had been around for the three years while the investigation was going on, that they would knock on his door and come in with 11 agents with guns and arrest him, even though he had been under investigation and was well aware of that. Um, and there's been, and you can look it up, lots of press about this case because, of course, uh, the the FDA-approved drug that his company sold and still sells today and is prescribed by doctors uh, has fentanyl in it. And so it is tagged now as part of the opioid crisis, uh, even though it has about 0.3% of the market and is not a source of you know, street drugs. Uh, the government, in its RICO indictment, refused to call the drug by its name. That's one of my favorite things, that, that to demonize. They call it a fentanyl spray spray, not once in the indictment do they call it substance, which is the name of the drug. I can't imagine why they would use the word fentanyl 5,000 times in a 72-page indictment. Um, but I think our biggest challenge, obviously, will be opioid, the opioid crisis is on everyone's mind. And so I wanted to talk just for a minute about voir dire, which I think is one of the most important parts of a case and probably one of the least practiced, especially among those of you who are in federal practice or federal court most of the time. And I want to urge you to keep trying to do voir dire, even if you do. When I go back to my downward mobility, I was in that wonderful prosecution. And then I was in private practice. And as a 39-year-old pregnant woman, Philip Morris was very desperate to win a case. And I guess they decided the other guys weren't doing it, so we might as well try the pregnant woman. And <laughs> 
they called me, and um, it was in Los Angeles, and there was, as you might imagine, a lot of um, bias against the tobacco companies, some very well deserved. And we did extensive motions trying to transfer the case. Those were summarily denied. But we asked for extensive voir dire, and the judge gave us three weeks of voir dire, individual voir dire with every single juror in chambers, and then group voir dire. And in the McVeigh-Nichols cases, we got individual voir dire in the public courtroom. But that was a very unusual experience, as everyone knows, uh, for any federal prosecutor, let alone a federal practitioner. So I got a lot of experience with that, and we won the case. Um, and so I am a big believer in that. And the best way to get that experience, at least today, is to be in state court. So unlike all my compatriots, while I was at Latham and Watkins first and then Paul Weiss, while they were in federal court, I was going into the hellhole jurisdictions in state court and was able to get an incredible amount of practice uh, with voir dire, which I think is really 80% of any trial. Yeah. It's just those of you, we all know that in federal court, you have no control over 80% of the case, so you work like hell on the 20% that you can control. Um, but I have had the experience more recently that federal judges are getting a little bit more flexible. Judge Howell, I know you're in here. I know you're not, but others are. Um, <laughs> and I think there's a lot you can do with that time if you try, but most importantly, I think you ought to try from the beginning. In most of these high profile cases, there's a very good reason for it. In our opioid case, the judge has already said that we could use a questionnaire. So my first practice tip is start asking and making the case for the bias and the, the necessity for voir dire from the motion, minute you file either your motion to dismiss or you file motions in limine, whatever it is, start making that case. And if you get a questionnaire, that will make it much easier to ask for follow-up. I've had experience in federal court where a judge will give you just 20 minutes. But even that, you can use to your advantage. I remember asking a client who tries, try their, they try more cases than anyone in the country, and I try a lot of cases for them. And I said, well, what is it that you really like about your trial lawyers? You know, how do you pick them? <laughs> and I thought, well, they're gonna say, of course, that you're a great orator, you're feisty, you don't give up. And they said, we have looked at all the data, and what we think makes a trial lawyer the best is someone, and these are jury trials, someone who is likable. Which I thought was very interesting, and all of us have different ways of being likable, but I think that's very true. And if you translate that into voir dire, um, many people have conventional attitudes about voir dire. You're either there to do kind of discovery, what is it people think generally, so you can exercise your peremptories, or they want to do cause challenges, which of course are also important and see what kind of bias people have, or some of us want to just build credibility with jurors. And I think that is more important than people realize because our whole job is to be the credible messenger for our clients. And in 20 minutes or four hours, you can either do that or really uh, ruin it, <laughs> depending on how you do it. But I think it's really important to think about voir dire that way, because otherwise you stand up after the prosecutor in a criminal case, the jury only knows that they think your client's guilty already, and it's very hard to break through and have them really listen to you. And so if there's any opportunity to have just that few minutes, and of course you can't take advantage of it, or judges will never let us have it, but I think it can make a real meaningful difference in cases. So uh, I hope Judge Burroughs is not here, but I'm sure someone will report back to her that um, our goal is to get some kind of voir dire uh, in a case like this where we know everyone who will be seated in the jury regardless of what we ask will be familiar with the opioid crisis and will have some very strong opinions about it. Chris, I thought you wanted to say something. Yeah, I, I wanted to wholeheartedly agree with you particularly about voir dire, uh, but also to say I also practice a lot in the state court, and I make a point of it. It, it. They are not the most lucrative cases for my practice, but they are always cases in which I'm either having a trial or I'm standing up and having a hearing. I'm standing up and doing something. Whereas these federal cases go on forever and some of them never get there. If you just have a federal practice, you're not going to be trying a lot and standing up a lot. And, and there's no substitute for that. So I, I agree with you totally about the state court. And, and on opioids, the FedEx case was also, that was what it was about, right? Shipping opioids. And we got a questionnaire. And I have to say it was quite frightening because pretty much everybody who looked good to me as a juror 
had a brother or a daughter or an uncle or somebody who had been, you know, terribly hurt by opioids. So uh, while we were picking this jury, the government, to our great surprise, decided to waive a jury trial and pretty much put us in a position where we kind of had to, too. Uh, and we and the client wanted to. I didn't really want to. Don't tell him that. But because um, I I believe in the Ed Edward Bennett Williams line that I'd rather try the case in front of twelve prejudiced people than one. You know. Yeah. But um, anyway, we waived the jury and we were successful. We I gave a four-hour opening statement, ne never done anything like that before in my life, with 150 slides that were fabulous that the graphics people figured out, and eventually the government dismissed the case. And I have to say, I just have one more little tiny story. So, so I'm in the middle of the four-hour opening statement, and I'm presenting really serious evidence, because I had it, which is very unusual in a criminal case. And there was a new prosecutor, an experienced guy, but, uh, but he was pretty newly assigned to this case. And as I would turn around during the breaks, he, he looked like he wanted to throw up. You know, he was staring at his shoes and he was green at the gills. And during one of the breaks, unbeknownst to me, George Niespolo, who's right here in the second row, who is a revered former prosecutor in our district, went to the guy who was turning green and staring at his shoes, the current prosecutor, and he walked him down the hall and he put his arm around him and he said, you know, this is on you now, you know? This, this, like, justice has to be done here. You, 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 know, you know what the job is. And that's what did the trick. Because eventually that guy dismissed the case. Beth, I want to go back to you on, an, uh, on a, something we talked about this morning, because you came from, uh, uh, obviously, a huge firm, and you've now opened up, you know, you know what's, I guess, the best, the mid-sized firm. And I asked you this qu a question this morning, and I, I thought I was going to get a totally different answer, and I was quite shocked. And what I asked you was, and I'll just ask you again today, and the audience can hear your answer, I said, so I'm assuming, obviously, at Paul Weiss, you have all these institutional clients, and what does your practice look like now? And I said, I have all these huge institutional corporate clients. And uh, that's where I think this is such a great panel because we all have different practices. I left, it took me a little longer than Chris to get with the program that things could be better on your own. But our market is big, high profile, bet the company cases. So to do that, you need lots of lawyers. I believe in the Cool and Powell doctrine of you know, bring an overwhelming force. If you're going to war, which a trial is, and um, I'm so old that I remember when women couldn't serve in combat, so I used to say it's the closest thing to combat women can get. So one of the many reasons I like it. And so we bring a lot of resources. We don't show them in front of the jury, but we bring a lot of resources and our clients expect that. And I think there's a huge market for people who've actually tried cases for diverse, talented lawyers, which is a very important principle for us at our firm, um, and companies like FedEx and many others are willing to put their money where their mouth is if they think that you have the ability and the talent. So we have FedEx, thanks to Chris. I called her as soon as they called me. Um, you know, we worked for Facebook, we worked for the NFL, Major League Baseball, the NCAA, we work for Bayer and Pfizer. Um, so we have you know, huge clients, and they, we also don't bill any hours, big advertisement, we do all alternative you should, fees. You should describe that, because that is really unusual. Right. Um, we, we don't do any billable hours, and if you ask us to, we say you should go find another lawyer. There's lots of lawyers who bill hours. And we charge alternative fees, sometimes with holdbacks and success fees, and so our realization rate is 100% for all you people out there at big firms. And, uh, <laughs> It's, it's been an incredible it's model. Like a it's monthly or what? I mean, yeah, we charge different charge? amounts, different months. That's very secret. <laughs> we sit it's around a phone and go, right. what do you think we should charge? But, but no, you we say, have a... You we say have. This, for the client, you say this amount per month. Yeah, a trial month costs a lot more, prep costs this much. Because you figure you know how much the prep is going to take? It's going to take 10 lawyers or 20 lawyers? And you know we always put a lot of lawyers on. So the idea is, you know, we're going to... 
a little, not as close as Gibson, but we probably bring four paralegals, 12 to 15 lawyers to almost every trial. And paralegals are the most important, really, but um, we need all the lawyers, and so we figure we kind of know what that'll cost, and in the end, it balances out. I have no idea if we get it right, except for we have really nice new offices, and we pay 150% of the big firm bonuses, so, so far, so good. But it's, 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 I think it's just great that you can see there's so many different ways to be successful, and I think you can get these big corporate clients that maybe before didn't want to, but in the trial world, they know that there aren't many people at big firms who try a lot of cases. So my message is go to state court, do civil work. Civil work, state court can be lucrative. We'll talk after, I'll tell you how to do that. <laughs> yeah. um, but me. do anything you can to get in court. I mean, because the clients are very sophisticated. They will ask you for your trial resume. And I've heard incredible stories in this criminal case where they interviewed a lot of people and you know, people, then they said, well, what cases have you tried to verdict in front of a jury? And there weren't a lot of cases. That's interesting. Um, Susan, let me ask you a question because you know, let's go back to Lynn for a second. I mean, this is a this is a woman that that could have, uh, you know, completely indemnified. She could have hired anybody she wanted. You know, I mean, obviously, even an individual like that can have the pick of anybody. Um, how does a client like that find somebody that has a you know small mid-sized firm? Well. The way that she found our firm was that she wanted to work with women. Lynn's a very feminist lady, uh, and our firm handled her civil litigation for many years. And then when the SEC came calling, then it was just a natural development that I would take the case over. I have to say, though, the way that I was able to hold on to the case is something along the lines that Beth has already described. I actually have a track record for trying cases and winning them early in my career. I won the Bear Stearns criminal case in the Eastern District of New York. And I think that helped me and helps me every day to have the credibility to get and to hang on to clients. And so in this case, back in the early parts of my career when I uh, got the Bear Stearns uh, client and then held on to him, I, it was really hard because that client's mother was a midwife uh, in Westchester, and as he explained to me, it turned out his mother had uh, ushered in the children of every white-collar defense lawyer in, in the Great. entire <laughs> New York area. I ended up essentially dealing with uh, probably dozens of lawyers trying to take that case away from me, and I was able to hold on to the case because he was able to see that my team and I were just doing a better job than the other people. And so I give him a lot of credit for having given me a chance earlier on in my career. And I think that is how I've been able to get in to hold on to clients like Lynn. But I'm very grateful to any client, uh, especially Lynn and this Bear Stearns client, who give me the, the chance, right? That's an amazing, amazing trust. And to it, it put me in that position knowing that it's not, uh, don't blame me, I hired Paul Weiss, but you know, I hired you. It's just a, a very, very sacred, sacred trust. And that's how we got Lynn, and that's how we held on to Lynn, was having a track record of knowing how to try cases and not to be immodest, doing, doing excellent work. Okay, let's end with this. One of the things we wanted to, to explore and if then get to any questions is, we wanted to offer some advice to any young lawyers in the audience about a path to being lead counsel uh, in white collar cases. Um, is, that, is that different panelists from lead counsel in a criminal case or a trial case in general? Um, Jamila? I, th I think that it is. I, I was very deliberate and, um, and my, my friends in, from Northern District are gonna keep me honest on this, but I was very deliberate about wanting to do white collar work and so when I went into the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, I was put in the violent crime section and I was sort of kicking rocks for a little while because I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be in white collar. And I made it known and I looked for an opportunity where I could let somebody up above in the big office uh, know that. And Sally Yates, I told her several times, oh, I want to work white collar. And I think she didn't know, think I was serious. So I just kept saying it until we got on a case together. And then I worked it up 
as Susan would say, I mean, I worked it up so well that I was actually out of the office when I got um, a call from Dave Namias that I was being moved to the, the economic crime section. And I was very deliberate when I went back to private practice about saying what I wanted my practice to be. Um, because it, because it, it, there is a lot to it, the complexities of the work that you have to do. Once you're like dealing with the stock transfer agent, for example, it's, it's very different from the evidentiary issues that you might have in a straight up criminal case. And I think sort of being able to dissect that and give it to the jury like a lay person, just explain it to them, is a very different and special skill that kind of takes a bit of time and, to get comfortable with it to get comfortable enough that it doesn't matter if there's a Gibson Dunn sort of standing on your shoulder, you're gonna be able to present that case. And so I think just being very intentional about what you want out of your practice and you know making sure that people know that. A lot of young lawyers think that we sit around in the evening we're wondering how we're gonna enhance your careers. And, and we just, we can't. We're not, like we just don't have the bandwidth. So if you let people know what it is you want and you keep going for that, that's how you're, you're gonna get it. And I think it's important to look for pro bono opportunities that are gonna get you stand up work, um, you know, because people, it's like you, you need experience to get experience. And people want to be able to trust you for the, bit, the bet the company cases, but they also need to know that you've, you've done something before. And so looking to partner on CJA matters or just looking for pro bono cases in state court where you can really stand up and I'm actually gonna start in um, next month. I have some of my team actually go to the Fulton County Solicitor's Office like one day a week to try D DUI cases because we have such talented lawyers just not getting enough stand up. And um, just to be up, and uh, as Chris and Beth and Susan have said, just to be up and doing it um, is, gonna be, is gonna be important. So I think you know, those are my kind of thoughts on it. Well, I, I just want to add my two cents a little bit. You know, I, I came from a state public defender's office, um, which meant that I tried a high volume of cases, so I've had a ton of trial experience. But when I left, that didn't mean that I was equipped to handle white collar work. Um, and I wasn't in a U.S. Attorney's office, I wasn't in a Fed PD's office, so I had to find my way on my own to federal experience, and I did that through mentors in the community that had federal experience that helped me. I did that through um, getting appointed on the CJA panel and getting my teeth cut on federal trials in our district, and then eventually I was welcomed into ha having the opportunity to do more corporate type white collar work. So, you know, there are many paths uh, to find your way to doing white collar work, there's not a one size fits all. Uh, Chris. Susan, before that, Go ahead. can I just add something? I, at this conference, we've heard a lot, of case, a lot of talk about this case called Herrera and the oral downloads. I'm here to say the case is actually called Sandoval, and uh, <laughs> Sandoval is Susan's client. You, you have to name my client, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> you have to do it. But Susan and I have had the pleasure of litigating together on an SEC case down in the Southern District of Florida, and it was actually Susan's client uh, and mine who got the oral downloads ruling. So Susan has managed to transform herself into a white collar defense lawyer and is practicing at the highest level. So there's a little plug for my friend Susan. <laughs> Thank you, my Susan. Thank you. Um, uh, Chris, can you talk to us about um, how you came to be in the position of lead counsel in white collar cases and your, you know, where you came from and what advice you would give to uh, a young lawyer looking to find their way to uh, a seat at the table where you are today? You know, I just defend whatever they prosecute <laughs> myself. <laughs> so in the old days, they were prosecuting drug cases and that's what I was doing. Then they changed to white collar, then that's what I was doing. Now it looks like it's gonna be immigration and low-level pot cases. I don't know what it's going to be. <laughs> Whatever they prosecute, I'm going to defend. Um, I guess I would say, you know, obviously you have to do a good job for your client, right? Of course. But I think I would also say be a good co-counsel. Be a person somebody wants to work with. You know, be, be the one who uh, is helpful to 
the other people in the case, to the extent that you can, of course, you know, conflicts and all of that. But, but, but if you are that person, then somebody's going to bring you in to the next case because they're going to say, I liked working with her, you know, because you're serious and, and you're easy to get a hold of and you know what you're talking about. Because we, I mean, I do think it is, I think corporate America does not naturally want to hire me to be their lawyer. Even the executives in, you know, r right now I have an executive for Wells Fargo. That was the other thing I was right. going to talk about. Right. Um, when those cases get passed around, they're usually being passed around by somebody from a big firm who represents the company, right? So you want to be somebody that that person knows and likes and trusts. So I think that's, that's a, a way in. Go ahead, Beth. I would just add, you know, don't wait for opportunities on a silver platter. I mean, I get those now at 55 years old, but I didn't get them, you know, when I started, and a lot of people wouldn't have tried a tobacco case back in, whenever that was, 1990-something, <laughs> and uh, 2001. You know, you're not, if you want to try cases, you have to make whatever out of the opportunity that you get, and you get the reputation Chris is talking about, and before you know it, I think once you get into that area, then you are hired a lot because, as I said, the clients want to look for trial lawyers. I think it's a little different. I don't agree with Chris that corporate America doesn't want to hire her. Well, they or want to hire you, apparently. <laughs> 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 but they want to hire you if they, when they know about you. Yeah. My point is uh, general counsels and heads of litigations have changed. Yeah. And it's I not agree. just because they're women and minorities, which there are a lot more but there's still white males there, and everyone in business realized they would rather have their trial lawyers look like their jurors, right. which means it's a business decision if you know what you're doing. Obviously, if you're not qualified, as you said, no one's gonna get ahead, but that's true for everybody. But I would say to, to women and people of color that there are extraordinary opportunities out there if you can distinguish yourself and if someone will open the door for you. So I leave that message, which is all of us in some way or the other have opened the door for each other and hopefully for a lot of other people. If you get to that place, please do it for somebody else. And if someone does it for you, you better walk through and knock it out of the park because we can open the door, but we can't do it for you. Well said. I think we're gonna end on that note and I wanna thank our fabulous panelists. Thank you. Thank you.